going. Um, so a couple little housekeeping things I want to start with. Um, uh, let's see, we've got, <clears throat> what I'm thinking is, so we can get through all this information. Um, we, we would love for you to join in the conversation, but please don't be offended if um, a topic is kind of cut short um, because we would really like to cover everything. Thing. Um, you are more than welcome to message Minda or myself privately if you have any um, things you want to discuss further. And we're also going to try and cut what we have to say by 945. Um, so uh, we can open it up for discussion if anyone has any specific things they want to talk about. So take some notes on that. Um, we've got, uh, as well as Minda here, we've got her husband. He's a firefighter from Long Beach. Um, he's there to answer any questions that you guys may have. Um, unfortunately, we do not have the firefighter that we were hoping to have uh, this evening that has tested positive for the COVID. He is resting because he's not feeling uh, top notch. So um, we, however, we've got um, also Ben Vernon here with us. Thanks for being here, Ben. Um, and he uh, is experiencing uh, if I'm if I've got the number correct, 17 other um, firefighters that are his colleagues that have tested positive. So um, if you've got any questions for Ben on how that's all being handled, uh, he is here to answer your questions. Um, and I've also got Amy Good here with us. She is um, an uh, ER. Yeah, Amy. Yeah, I work in the ER at UCSD in downtown San Diego. I'm one of the nurses. So, so she's in it um, every single day right now. So if you've got any specific questions for an ER nurse, she is also here uh, at the end of this discussion to ask some questions. Um, I'm not gonna waste any more time. I'm gonna hand it over to Minda. Um, basically, I'll give you a short understanding of why this happened. Um, Jamie Lee, uh, Tiffany, a friend of mine, reached out yesterday, and I read her text wrong, actually. She said to me um, she felt as though there needed to be some more resources out there for the firefighters um, to help out their spouses, and I read it as we need to get something out there for the spouses, and so apparently uh, you guys were the dynamic that needed uh, to, to be spoken to and um, talk through this time with um, and our intention tonight is to give you tools to be stronger through this struggle. Um, we're not here to uh, downplay the severity of this situation or go against anything, any information that's out there, simply to give you some peace of mind to get through this with your spouses stronger. Um, so Minda, thanks for being here. I'm gonna let her take the mic. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm super excited that everybody's here. I uh, just wanted to introduce myself for people that don't know me. Um, I, my name is Dr. Minda Oz. I am a clinician. I only work with uh, first responders. I have my own practice in Redlands, and I've been working with first responders for um, about six years. This is my sixth year doing it, and I work with their families as well. I teach a lot at different departments and speak. Um, I also wrote a book about this crazy life we live as first responder families because we just kind of all have a different set of rules than the average couple. And uh, I always joke and say somebody forgot to give us the rule book on it. <laughs> and there's a lot of stuff that we um, go through that regular couples don't. So um, I'm here today. Ashley came to me and said, would I do this with her? I said, absolutely, uh, because not only am I clinician, but I've been married 23 years to it, and my son just started. So I have the double concern and worry as well with everybody else. So we're just here just to kind of ease those um, concerns, maybe give you guys some tips on how to deal with it. Um, not obviously we can't change anything or make it go away. Just we want to be here to support everybody. Yeah. Yes. So um, just for us to get started, um, like we said, we're gonna keep on a good time frame so that people can get to bed. Um, but the one thing I think that, it, that we have to discuss is you know, there's a lot of media out there and the numbers um, and the nurses can talk to it better than I can. 
but we did some research, my husband and I yesterday did some research just to see the numbers um, in California. Uh, and we looked at what, how many are testing positive and what that percentage is, because when they tell you on the news, they tell you like globally, which makes it a little bit more scarier. Um, but I think it's just being aware of the, that there's always going to be risk for our first responders, whether it's this or something else, they go into people's homes. Um, you know, they come in contact with all sorts of cooties. As I say, I always tell my husband and my son to put his their take their boots off. Don't bring your cooties into the house because they go into other people's homes. But I think we have to be aware that as um, first responder families, I mean, our spouses are in danger every day they walk out the door. And for me, I don't, I can't think about it all the time. If I think about it all the time, I think we'd be nuts thinking about how at risk they are all the time. And so I think this is not anything different other than obviously there is more exposure. Our first responders are definitely gonna test, more are gonna test positive than the numbers that are coming out now. That's coming. Inevitably, we just got another phone call tonight that another firefighter from Long Beach tested positive or is having symptoms. So it's going to happen because they're out there. They're going into people's homes and they are more exposed than those of us staying home. Um, but there are other um, exposures that they have. I think that they uh, deal with every day, you know, cancers, injuries, PTSD. Um, they have you know, the line of duty deaths, all those things that they're always worrying about every day. So they're very highly trained for high risk. Um, and they're doing a lot of things to take precautions. And maybe the firefighters later can talk about what those precautions are. Um, Ashley, did you want to talk about the how we're going to prepare? I kind of skipped over a couple of things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so something that I thought was really important to talk about Obviously, I'm not in your situation right now. I don't have uh, a firefighter coming home. Um, and so I'm in a, a, in a different situation than you. But I do think it's something that needs to be talked about. What are you going to do with your family if your spouse tests positive? having the, the, the conversation with them. Are you, do you live in a home that um, has the population that is being impacted by this uh, illness? Um, do you have small children at home? Are you going to, if they test positive, are you going to um, have them stay at one of the hotels that are allotted for first responders to go to check with your departments to see what that um, protocol is for them um, as far as i know uh, i'm not even going to say a number because I, I don't like repeating numbers but there are hotel rooms set aside for first responders for if they do test positive and they need to go and be quarantined. Is that something that's going to be the best option for your family? Um, are you going to let um, your children greet your spouse as usual when they come home if they are positive? Having that open dialogue with your spouse is imperative and having communication before something happens is going to give you more success if it does happen. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm a prime example of that. I would have been lost if Corey and I did not discuss the what ifs. Um, and I would say that discussing the what ifs is not admitting that something could happen, but it is preparing you for if it does happen. That's, and I think that that's very true because like I said earlier, this is a high risk career, regardless of this virus or not. And some, a lot of the homes, um, you know, have two people where there's um, one spouse is a nurse and you have your firefighters. So you have a double, you know, whammy coming home in the house and figuring out what the plan is, is very important because in the midst of crisis, you don't think logically you're thinking more um, emotionally as opposed to using your logic and having that plan um, set up. Somebody put in the notes that I thought was a really good idea is if you have an RV, 
and it's in the side of the yard, you know, like parked in the, in the side or on the front, that that might be a good place to, to go to instead of in the house. I know we have at Long Beach, we have eight firefighters that have tested positive and they are all home quarantining right now. Um, and they're all doing okay. They're not, um, they're just um, staying home right now and, and seeing how things go. But I think that being aware always um, is important for us as fire families. Uh, and something that I said in the video earlier today, what we all need to remember that if, if your spouse does um, test positive, please remember that this is not an automatic death sentence, okay? They've got to have you there. They chose you for a reason. They need you to be strong. Right now they're on hypervigilance mode. They've got to do all this extra stuff and you're at home holding down the fort as usual, but a whole lot harder. Uh, Cause you, you, everything has been flipped upside down. Okay. So just remember that this will pass and it's just a matter of getting, uh, getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. Yeah. Exactly. And this will pass. Just like she said, we've had other viruses that were extremely contagious and we got through it. This is a bad time. Um, but for what I see in my community and my friends, the fear is really through the roof. And I get it that we're all a little nervous. We're all scared. But I, I would challenge you to ask yourself, sitting at home, watching the news endlessly, one, is, is not going to be beneficial for you, for your mental health, for any children that you have in the house, because your fear and your anxiety and, and watching isn't going to change the outcome. It, you're doing everything you can that you've been told to do. And so it's not going to change the outcome. It's just going to freak you out and you're going to have anxiety. You're going to be more short and irritable with your kids, which uh, God bless those of you that have little kids at home right now. Um, I'm sure that that is really difficult to do. That adds on top of your stress. Um, and I think that the biggest thing, I remember um, my son was three after 9-11. And I had the news on day in and day out, just trying to you know watch and find out what was happening. Because I thought, well, my three-year-old, he's not going to really understand what the news is saying. And I was driving down the road and he started telling me three in a car seat still that we should pray for the firemen and that he had been absorbing what was being said. So I, the, the social media, the news, I limit yourself to maybe once a day, just kind of checking in to see where things are, if any new things have happened. Um, because if you inundate yourself, because that's all the news is talking about. And so, you know, it's like the world is ending, you know, because that's what sells is sensationalization on the, on the news and, and they're not really breaking it down. So if you can limit, that is very critical. And then also being aware of your kids in the room and talking about it too much in front of them. Even if you're on the phone, you know, our little eavesdroppers, they hear everything, um, you know, we're having conversations. So we just need to be careful because if they're under 10, they will, they can understand the words that you're saying, but they don't understand what it means like in the whole picture. So they're not able to process. So, and they're going to go off of us. So if we're anxious, they're going to be anxious. If we're running around scared, that's what they're going to do. I think it's very important, just like Minda was saying, to check in with yourself. If you find yourself at a higher level in, of anxiety and fear, and you're finding yourself scrolling all day long you need to check what what you're doing for yourself because um i'll i'll give you an example here if i did the same thing with the thomas fire i wouldn't have found out through social media if something happens you're going to find out from the people that need to let you know not social media so give yourself a break. So I, I, I want to move in since, since we're kind of in this little transition phase. I want to talk about what are you guys doing to get through this time, right? So um, 
unfortunately, well, I don't know, quarantine kind of came at the right time for my family. Uh, Taylor, the, uh, my little one, got hit with hand, fin foot, and mouth uh, on the 15th. So I've been at home, uh, what, like 11 days now or something like that because of that. I've been to the store once. Uh, and I went for a hike once and I had so much anxiety <laughs> after going for the hike because I was like, oh my God, I wasn't supposed to go out. Like, <laughs> ah, I'm going to get sick. You know, anyway. So what has worked for me over these past 11 days is routine. Ask yourself, what are you doing for your family to make the norm out of this abnormal situation? So I'll give you my example. My girls are two and five, so Evie is in preschool, but I'm also, homeschooling is not my jam, so I'm going to uh, facilitate my home in a way that I know I'm going to stay sane. So what my day looks like is I let them wake up, I let them watch a little TV while they're drinking their milk, and I'm drinking my coffee. Then we get some breakfast started. Then we get all rounded up and we go for a walk around, um, around the neighborhood, get them out to get myself out. We come home and then they have um, some time to do some sort of activity not in front of the TV. Because I found that with my children and I'm sure you see it with your children, if you're in front of the TV all day long, everybody's irritated more. Um, and so we come home and they do some puzzles or something activity based that is not in front of the TV. Then we have lunch, then they go down for naps, then I work out. Staying on whatever routine that you had is imperative that you do the best that you can to maintain that right now. Um, for the people that, that don't exercise and do do extracurricular activities on a regular basis you're still active on a normal uh day-to-day -day. this sedentary is going to fuck with your mind um and so you have to give yourself the permission to practice things that are going to keep your your mental state level for me, that's, that's physical fitness. And so I've made that a priority and have worked it into my schedule in my day. Second half of the day, I let them watch a little more TV because I'm not trying to entertain, get dinner rolling, and they're in bed. You, ha you, ha you guys, your, your fire spouses, you know what's up. You are the, 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 the people of the home, right? So get everybody in line it's bedtime and I'm not messing around because used, this is, yeah, I was just going to say we're used to chaos, right? When I mean, we're used to being single parents, you know, I call myself a single married person all the time. And so we're used to this. It's just that it's off of our normal schedule, which ca will cause anxiety for a lot of fire spouses and significant others, because we thrive off of the schedule. We thrive off the routine because that's how we control the chaos. So for, like Ashley is saying, even if you have to write down a schedule at first for your kids, like a whiteboard or a piece of paper so that they can see it, you can see it, you can like visualize it till you get used to it because there will be that space of anxiety of doing it different and feeling like it's off. The other thing is a lot of parents, we need to let our kids, we don't have to entertain our kids 24 seven. They can go entertain themselves. They can go outside and walk around the backyard. Like it isn't your responsibility to entertain your children 24 seven. Listen, I'm old. And when I was a kid, if I dare said I was bored, I don't know who else's parents said, oh, I got something for you to do if you're bored. So we never said that because you know, you would get chores or something. So that is a great skill that you can use this time to teach your kids is how to be calm, be quiet. We are such an active society. If we're not busy, we're on social media. So our brains are constantly going. And this is a great opportunity to teach your kids how to be quiet and how to quiet their minds and to rest. They don't have to be going a hundred miles a minute. And that's what the, uh, whatever vocabulary word you want to 
put in here, put it in. But that's what the universe is giving us right now. Mm -hmm. Giving us the opportunity to stop. And because we're in this realm of uh, first responder, well, you guys are, you know, anyway, um, it's, a, it's different for you guys. But as the spouse is your home, so remember that, that God, the universe, whatever term you want to use, is actually telling you, you have to stop right now. Think about it. Do you like, I, you know, I can't predict the future, but do you really think you'll ever have an opportunity to be forced to stop ever again? This is a really important time for all of us. And if you can stay grounded through this time, I guarantee it you're going to be a stronger human being and your, your relationships are going to be stronger after this as well. And that's the other thing too, that I preach all the time is that fire families, any first responder fire family, cops, fire, anything, uh, EMS communication is our only tool. I mean, communication Paramount. is we have to over communicate actually, because we, we are ships passing in the night sometimes. And so if we are not, over communicating that's where the miscommunication and the fights start and i think being very um i think giving each other a little bit more grace than usual because everybody's kind of on edge right we're on edge because we're the ones at home taking care of the house the family we don't know if they're bringing cooties home to us we don't know what's going on um and then they come home and they've been hyper vigilant you know they've had to be extra hyper vigilant right they have all these new protocols about you know, they send one person in to go do an evaluation before they let the rest go in. So there's all these new procedures. So everybody is hyper vigilant, which means everybody's going to be more irritable. And so being able to make sure you have that good transition period for your first responder when they come home, even our, um, our ER nurses, they, I say they're the last leg of our first responders. It starts with dispatch, ends with our ER. And that, that you guys need to have a conversation about what does your transition look like, right? So my husband came home, uh, he came home late yesterday because he's uh, in charge of the EOC. So he's been there every day. Today was his first whole day off and he did not know what to do with himself. He was doing that like anxious walk. So, you know, we kind of came up with a plan today to go do lawns, um, to do something with himself, to have that transition, to kind of switch his brain out of that hypervigilance. So communicating with your first responder is going to be really important, even if you're irritated, even if he's irritated, just listening and letting people vent. Just because someone's got a feeling doesn't mean we have to fix it. We just got to listen to it. Yeah. Um, any, the other thing I've had a couple people ask me about is how do I tell my kids? I think it's really important that it's age appropriate. Um, and you don't need to give all the details. You know, you can just say that people are getting sick and so we're staying home so that, you know, we don't get sick and we don't get other people sick. And that's it, that's all they need to know. They don't need to know the numbers. They don't need to know how many people are dying. They don't need to know those things because it's just way too much for their brains to take in. And honestly, they don't really care. Really, <laughs> they, just, they just go with the flow and do what you tell them to do. So the last little bit that we've got here, and then we can open it up. Um, I'm just going to give you some examples of, of taking care of yourself through this. So you can get through this um, together. Um, give yourself permission uh, to do something that makes you feel good. Take a bath. Pray. Uh, journal. Practice deep breathing exercises. Do your hair and makeup. <laughs> we all know that that feels good that's one of the routine things you probably yeah. need to add to your list is brushing your teeth in the morning because <laughs> we're not leaving and so who gives a shit but brush your teeth and make your bed you know yes. um give yourself the permission to lock yourself in your closet for five minutes if you need to do that so you so you don't have the the blow up on your kids you know um 
like I said before, the level of activity, exercise um, by walking, running, do some yoga, stretching. There's so many options out there that are virtual right now. If you guys need some more ideas, let me know. Um, do some, okay, you guys have probably already done this. Do some spring cleaning and organize your house. When you're organized and you've got routine and things are neat around you, your mental health is going to be better. Um, board game, you know, um, meditation, um, writing down five things that you're grateful for every morning, FaceTime with, with your loved ones if you're not able to see them. Um, we have someone in our family, grandma, who uh, is in the age bracket that's being affected by this. So I've literally been on our own uh, this whole time. But because of the day and age, you already know this. You have the ability to, to be with them. And the most important thing I think out of all of this is reach out to someone else to see if you can help them. You guys are helping me by allowing me to help you. Mm -hmm. That is what gets you through tough times. That is why I'm sitting here is because Corey gave me a platform to be able to help other people. And that's all I want to do because that's the only thing that gets me through. So put it into your own practice. You have things to offer other people. So give, because the more you give, the more you're going to get, I promise you. Mm -hmm. Yes. The other thing is, is when you have conversations with people, um, I mean, I'm sure everybody's doing it, but just remind yourself, try not to talk about this all the time. You know, try to have regular conversations, try to I don't know, talk about some reality show, talk about, you know, try not to always talk about the heavy stuff to give yourself a break um, from the intensity. And Ashley's right. Um, paying it forward is, it feels so much better and helping others. Um, the other thing I want to add is that if you're, and I, and I'm seeing this, so um, I don't know, I'm not saying who, if it's you or not, but some marriages already maybe were struggling before this happened and now this has happened. And so it puts you stuck in the house with each other. There's no escape. So it may intensify whatever was underlying anyways, but just know that most of the counselors that work with the first responders have all got the telehealth option. So if you don't want to leave and go to the office to be seen, um, but you really need someone to talk to, there are a lot of options for the telehealth to get somebody just to have a neutral perspective. That's all that I offer couples is the neutral perspective because I'm not emotionally invested in your marriage and relationship. So I can look at it from the outside. So um, that's there for you as well if um, this time does add more stress on your marriage. Ultimately, yeah. what this virus is doing is bringing out people's ultimate fears. Mm -hmm. You're having to face it head on, and it's your opportunity right now to do something with it. You're going to get through this. We're all going to get through this. It's a scary, uncharted territory, but this will too pass. I promise you. This isn't an, a, a, a pandemic that is if it hits you you're gone you have to keep that into into perspective we're gonna get through this even those dark fears that you've got surrounding it yeah. uh, i think now minda you think a good time to open up yeah. for some discussion and questions if anybody's got anything you've got the mute button up at the top uh top panel up there if anybody wants to ask anything or say anything shoot I see a lot of really good comments in the chat about stuff for kids. I, I'm assuming everybody else can see the, the chats as well. Um, some people posted some stuff already about things you can check out for talking to your kids. Um, and then somebody said something about having older children. So my son is 22 and lives at home still. Um, and he just became a firefighter. So he's off or he works two days he's home for so a lot of the times it's just him and i and my husband's gone and i think it's just about getting creative sometimes we watch movies um we already set up tonight before i did this i said okay you're home and i'm home tomorrow dad's gone 
what's our day look like? And we set up a schedule already for what we're going to do. We're going to go, we're going to go on a walk. We're going to um, clean the house. We're going to hang out. So we already have that plan set up. So I think it's just, you know, creating different things to do. I've, he's cooked dinner for me because we got the hello fresh. So he cooks dinner. So I think with your older kids, you know, sometimes you can be there for them. And sometimes like I'm, I'm even my 22 year old. I'm like, can you go to your room? <laughs> you leave me alone. <laughs> so I just want to say, um, I have twin 11 year olds. They're fun, crazy kids. And they are what I, what's, what I found is to work for, for us is that I give them exactly what they're going to do for the week ahead of time. And I let them know you can play the iPad this amount of time and Hey, it's okay for them to play the iPad <laughs> guys. Mm -hmm. We have to have some sanity. They have to have some fun. So I give them this X amount of day. You get to do this and here's what we're going to do. You're going to do this curriculum, the schools, this school sent out, and then you guys can play the iPad. We're going to have lunch. We're going to go. I made them go in the pool today. It was freezing, but they went in the pool for an hour, a half an hour, had a blast, came back in, play the iPad again. We're watching a movie, get showers, dinner. And so we have a schedule and that's what we do. And to your point earlier about what, what your husband's going to do if they get it, my husband has refused to come home if he's exposed. So he's told his department, if he gets it, you got you to gotta isolate me go to a hospital or sorry, hotel, whatever it is, I'm going to be, I'm not going to give it to my family. So we've discussed it. He'll be isolated and he won't come home. And we, you know, that's the way it's going to be. My kids are not afraid of this. They don't even really, they're like, again, they're 11. They understand why they're out of school, but they don't really know people are dying. I don't put the news on at all during the day. I have it on my phone and I check it but I purposely do not put it on because I don't want them hearing it at all because they're old enough to know and they're going to get freaked out if it's on there. Mm -hmm. Just my two cents. Yeah. Uh, Amy, it looks like we've got a question yes. for you. This is from Lindsay. My question might be for Amy. I'm expecting baby number three in the next couple of weeks. My fear isn't a positive test. My fear is the incubation time when we don't know and could be exposed. Any advice for when they are home on days off between shifts? Should they be stripping down before they come in the house? So um, my kind of general policy for myself, um, because I'm out there screening in our uh, flu and COVID-19 screening tents we have put out now in the, for the community, um, basically, I wear my own personal scrubs. I don't have hospital scrubs. I, I get home, let my shoes stay in my car. To get my Basically, we're joking about how everyone's going to get a strip show in their front yard where they're front, first responders. Mm -hmm. Strip down basically outside, toss everything into the laundry, and um, put it on high. Um, then just basically hop in the shower, and, and that's going to be the best kind of line of protection on the way home. Um, for some of my staff that have been exposed to positive um, patients, the guideline for us is to be taking our temperatures every 12 hours, um, to be looking for any kind of fever, because um, that sometimes is the, is the first sign. Um, so there's, like I said, that incubation period, it's anywhere between two days to about 10 days is the, with an average of about five days before they start showing symptoms. So. Unfortunately, there's not really much we can do other than taking, you know, taking extra precautions, making sure we're cleaning ourselves, really good hand hygiene for the whole family. Um, it's really important at this time. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Amy. And P uh, by the way, I'm sorry for um, not thanking you for, for speaking. Uh, the last person that um, just put in their two cents, my apologies. I think my son, uh, West Covina Fire, he, they made a policy that they uh, come to work in street clothes and go home in street clothes. They wash their uniforms at work and don't bring them home and wash them. I mean, that should be the case anyways because of the carcinogens and the cancer risk that they're exposed to. Um, but I think that some departments have gotten kind of lazy with that. So now they're stepping that back up to not bring their clothes and their boots home at all. If you do strip down in the garage or in the backyard or on the side, <laughs> literally 
put it, you know, leave them out. Uh, if you wash them, I would not wash them with anybody else's clothes. I would do a, a clean cycle in between just to be safe. Um, I know that somebody asked for uh, Jeff, um, if you're on, I didn't let him come in here with me. I made him do it in the other room. My husband, he, they, someone was asking about what is the turnaround for test results for the firefighters? Uh, so in, uh, in Long Beach, uh, we're getting the test results back in 24 hours if they're first responders and they have a known exposure and they're symptomatic. Um, I'm not sure if Ben's on, if, uh, if they have the, the same, uh, but we've got a pretty good agreement with our health department to get that that test turned around pretty quick. Um, I do know that some firefighters who went and tested on their own because they just weren't feeling well, it's taken some anywhere in the neighborhood from three to six days to get those results back. Thank you, Chief, for answering my question. Uh, was that something that you guys had to put in place? It's sounding like uh, that it's not the case out in the San Bernardino regions. Um, they've got folks that are 9, 10, 12 days uh, post-test without results. So is that something that um, you took to an administration uh, to handle? Yeah, that was uh, that was pushed very heavily from, from our command staff down to the health department that it, it's a must do. Uh, you know, I mean, it's the, the first responders are going to get hit hard with it because we don't, we don't have a choice to, to isolate all the time, right? We have to go into the houses to help people and, and uh, especially early on, you know, the, the 911 callers were not being honest with what their signs and symptoms were. Mm -hmm. um, so we set up screening protocols through our dispatch and we've gone now as far as they get, they get uh, double screened on the 911 call in and when the, the companies arrive, they get screened again before the entire crew goes in. Okay. Thank you, sir. Additionally, to add on to that, um, it depends on who the public health county is contracted with. Um, I know there are some tests at our hospital that we can run in about six to six hours, um, but there are other hospitals that don't have that um, option, and so they're being sent out, and it takes up to, like he was saying, about six days or so to get some of the results back. Yeah, we're kind of unique in, in Long Beach. So there's uh, there's basically three large health departments in Los Angeles County. And one of them's the County of Los Angeles, one of them's Pasadena, and one of them's Long Beach. So our health department can now do the testing on site, uh, but there's still, a, you know, there's still about a day's delay in doing so. Um, somebody, hey, Jeff, another question. Somebody said that the hospitals aren't telling the firefighters if their patients were testing positive. Um, is that, do you find that to be the case or do they notify the department if they find out later that the patient tested positive? Uh, well, again, it, it's got to be pushed uh, for the test results. So, you know, it was mentioned the incubation period. So some of these patients, you know, they're, everybody's going out on regular 911 calls still and they're, they're treating patients appropriately. And then the, the patient that they treated may not show up as symptomatic for a couple of days. And based on their symptoms is when the hospital's going to test them. And then the hospitals aren't really good with sharing information going backwards. So uh, we're fortunate. We have nurse educators on staff uh, that have direct lines of contact with the hospitals. Um, so we're, we're able to extract that information. But again, it, it, you know, we're looking at sometimes five, six, seven days before that's realized. Just because the, you know, the patient doesn't always show symptomatic right away. And then they have to be tested, and then there's the delay in getting the test back, so on and so forth. Yeah. It's not a perfect system. And somebody else asked, you know, how do you balance the hypervigilance to not expose others? At some point, you just have to take a breath and realize some of it's out of your control. You can only do the best you can. And at the end of the day, because we are our first responder families, we are exposed more than the average person and we do have to be careful but at some point we still have to live and we still have to go to the grocery store and pick up the essentials so we just do the best we can we're not going to be perfect at it we're not gonna you know and you cannot obsess about it so much that it creates so much anxiety that now you you know have an anxiety disorder and you're afraid to go out even after it's cleared because that can happen you know, if you just get yourself so worked up and in your head, and now you're just afraid to go out in general when it gets called, you know, everybody's allowed to go back. 
Uh, we, ha we had a question come in from Jamie Lee. Um, has overall call volume stayed flat? Uh, what are we seeing in SoCal? Uh, also, have, how have the calls changed from the past with protocols and procedures? Uh, for us, our call volumes actually decreased. <laughs> which is kind of a blessing in disguise. Uh, people, I think, are taking a little more care of themselves. Uh, they're, you know, they're not out and about, so we don't have the falls and the traffic collisions and things like that. Um, and from what I know, also, the PD's calls for service have gone down for pretty much the same reasons. What has gone up on the PD side is the complaints of the businesses being open, uh, you know, for takeout food and stuff. People are misunderstanding what some of those orders mean. And what was the I'm second seeing part everybody of the agree answer? with that. Um, well, I'm just seeing everyone agreeing with yeah. the call volumes going down. Yeah. Um, the In second, second, they've gone down as well. Yeah. How have the call the calls changed from the past within protocols and procedures? Jamie, maybe uh, unmute yourself and uh, help me understand what that said. Well, I'm just trying to understand, like, I know Brad has come home and talked to me about, like, what they do, but I guess I don't really know what they've always done in the past. So how has, you know, from when they've arrived to on scene, I think they, what I understand is one person is going in. Um, I guess I've never really asked the question to Brad, but um, would just love to kind of understand that whole process. So, so before COVID, uh, 911 caller would call in. You know, 911, what's your emergency? Oh, somebody's having chest pain. And they would go down, the dispatchers would go down, down a line of questions that pertained strictly to chest pain and re related illnesses or injury. And based on those answers, that's how the call gets dispatched. Now, uh, pretty much every 911 system in the country is asking a series of questions about uh, cough and cold like symptoms, fever, uh, out of the country was uh, one of the leading questions. It's now been eliminated because we have community spread here within the United States. So the, the line of questioning has changed. And then uh, for, for us in Long Beach, we run a four person engine and truck company. So we've adopted a one in three out rule. So one firefighter will go uh, to the front door uh, with uh, some PPEs on and they will try to get the patient to come outside if that's possible. They will ask those same questions that were asked over the 911 call in. And if they go full PPEs or not, and then how many uh, other crew members they bring in. So the, our, our response modalities have changed in that sense. Um, we, we, we've done other things. There's been some treatments uh, that are done in the field that are now discontinued when you go into the hospital, when you cross the threshold, just on a temporary basis. So we've, we've made a lot of adjustments in that, in that sense and understand that, you know, if you're, if your firefighter comes home and they're, and they're a little bit frustrated because, wow, they changed the rules again. It's because we're still kind of learning about this virus. There's, there's things that we're learning, you know, every day there's, there's new updates uh, people are discovering ways to do things and then it's getting shared and other agencies are adapting uh, to that based on their success. Um, we had MJ asked, does anyone have any experience with older family members in the home with your firefighters? Are, are people keeping social distance within the home as well? I mean, anybody that's got... Um, an older family member at home. I mean, that does pose a, you know, they're the more at risk population. And I think those families have to figure out for themselves individually, what they're going to do, whether they're going to, you know, keep the, their um, elderly family member in the home and just try to keep the distance from the firefighter. Um, but that's going to be difficult because the firefighter touches things and, you know, they're just, there together. So I think that is a personal thing that people have to figure out in your family. You know, is this elderly person got health problems? Maybe they could go stay, you know, someplace else or um, in a hotel or with other family. I don't know if that's possible, but figuring out what's best for your family. Um, but again, yes, they're going to be at risk because your first responder, we don't know always what they're exposed to. We don't know if a client, if a patient has tested positive always. So, you know, you have to assume if you have um, elderly or the at-risk population, you know, that already have 
underlying medical issues that you're going to have to take better precautions because there is a higher exposure with your firefighter or your first responder or ER nurse coming through the door. Um, I kind of would like to say something on that. So my, we don't have kids. It's just the two of us, um, just because we're so busy in life and all that fun stuff. But my husband's parents are both elderly and they do need a lot of assistance to the point of showering. They still live at home. And so for a while he was assisting his mom and helping doing that. Um, but as soon as all this started, we both just kind of kept our distance from it. I'm a school teacher. I mean, I kind of was getting exposed with that also. So our schools closed a week prior to the whole world shutting down. And as soon as we shut down, I was like, I'm not going over there um, just to be safe. But he's also stepped back definitely. And other people that aren't as out and about and exposed to things are now assisting. And that was kind of our personal choice to help just kind of keep that social distance. So I definitely agree, though. I think it depends on um, your situation, but it's kind of what we've done. So, yeah. That's good. And, yeah, and, that, and that's a really good, oops, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say that's a really good tactic because, you know, right now the demographics are still showing that the, you know, the, the vulnerable population is the very old, the very young, and all those inclusive with pre-existing medical conditions. Uh, Jeff, I don't mean to uh, question what you just said. That's the very first time I've ever heard that young are uh, high risk. I was just going to add to that. The young actually have a very, very um, low, almost lowest mortality rate um, or fatality rate with this disease. They seem to recover very well in international studies. I did, I did see a, uh, a comment about the PPEs. So normally what we do uh, as far as the personal protective equipment uh, before this was uh, gloves. And if there were any sort of secretions or blood or anything like that, uh, the firefighters would don uh, a set of goggles or some sort of eye protection. Now it's uh, both of those, uh, a gown, and then also an N95 mask. And then they're, all, they're also, uh, a lot of times they're putting the N95 mask on the patients as well. I saw hey, somebody Ben. Oh, go ahead. Well, I'll just, uh, sorry, Minda. I'll, ben, okay. you're still on, right? Ben Vernon, are you still on? Never mind. Never mind. I did see some, Patricia, she um, said, uh, is it going overboard to assume that once hubby comes home, He's very likely to have been exposed. So we then need to close our circle back down to exclude my grandparents and then my parents in their 60s. He says no. Um, you got to I mean, there is some assumption there that even if it's not your firefighter that's been exposed, um, there may be the shift before that, you know, maybe they got a call with a patient and they didn't clean the, um, the station down very well or you know, you had interaction with them. I think that for now, if you are married to a first responder or you are a first responder, that, you know, for now you have to assume that you may have been exposed to it more likely than someone who's not a first responder. I think it goes back to what we discussed earlier. If you got to go based off of what's mm -hmm. best for your family. Yeah. I mean, bottom line, you, you got to take care of your family and you got to do what's best for you. So if everyone is comfortable with the way that you're running through this situation, then stay true to your gut. Yeah. You can just do the best you can in this situation. And I think the most important thing is one, reach out for support. Don't think you can do it alone. Two, cut yourself some slack. Um, and three, try to have as much normalcy as you possibly can because we thrive, our brains thrive on routine and what we've set up. And so um, making sure that you create a new um, routine is going to help some of your sanity as well till we get through this.
we got a lot of stuff rolling through the chat is that, is there anything in there that anyone wants to unmute themselves and needs to say because we're we're getting tight on time here and i want to make sure that uh everyone has a chance to say something if they need to say something ashley i had a question for jess this is lindsay um as far as the quarantine process for cal fire is it coming from headquarters or is it different for each unit? Like where should we be going to find out what that policy is? Uh, I would I would start with your with your uh, unit. You know, the battalion chief should have that information. The unit chief should definitely, um, I, I, don't, I don't have that answer. I'm not a CAL FIRE employee any longer. Um, I stay in pretty close touch with them, but I don't know what their policy is. Uh, Lindsay, I'll do some digging and see if I can figure that out. Um, I did. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I had a question too um, regarding the mask. Maybe Amy, I think, could answer, and also the firefighter. Um, what mask and how often are our guys using their masks? To I know my husband's department. Um, they're told every five patients they can change out their mask. And they are told not to wear an N95 mask in the ER. Um, so I'm just curious, are the nurses walking around the ER not with a patient wearing mask? If so, which one? And then what is Long Beach's policy on mask in the ER? Well, in the field, we're, we're, we're using an N95 or higher. Uh, and they're, if they have a patient that's symptomatic, as far as I know, they're wearing them all the way till they exit the emergency room. Actually, there, some of them are even leaving them, leaving them on a, while they're cleaning the rigs. So our ER policy right now, um, in the emergency department, we are wearing surgical masks unless we are actively caring for a COVID-19 rollout patient, at which point we are told to only be wearing surgical masks with a face shield, um, unless we're doing a procedure such as intubation um or aerosolizing medications um at which point then we are told to be using an n95 um the research i think is not back as far as the um whether it's airborne or droplet um the cdc at this time is saying droplet precautions is all that's needed unless you're doing those special procedures um as far as what the San Diego fire and um, their medics are wearing when they show up to us, they are most of them wearing N95s if they're coming in with um, respiratory patients. And, and Amy, are you guys, are you single use? I've, I've heard, and it's all unconfirmed, um, you know, ways, ways we to auto. Are, we're so short on PPE that um, we're told not to throw away any of our PPE for the whole shift. Um, so I think it depends on what kind of supplies are in stock and how your stock is right now. So right now we are told not to throw it away because we don't have the supplies. I don't know how that is for the um, fire department. We're in not much better shape. Yeah, they're, I didn't think so. They're a little much. hard to come by. <laughs> you know, every, everybody in the nation wants them. Again. Keep those soft masks being sewn. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool to see that. I know some. All right, guys. Yeah, one more question though. I think that I think is a really good question. Is is um, any other fire people that are on here besides Jeff? Is somebody asked? Are they changing the way they do things at the station? Like, are they eating together? Not eating together? Are they staying apart? Because you know the fire station, they are usually really close-knit and with each other. So I don't know if anything's changed there. Uh, we've spread out a little bit at the table, um, you know, but that's a cultural thing that's, that's kind of difficult to do because, you know, we, we are the second family. Uh, I know that a lot of stations in Long Beach, uh, they have a second set of shoes at the bottom of the stair, like at, at station one where I work at the bottom of the stairs, there's a, there's a corridor for boot cleaning and uh, then you have a second set of shoes and the shoes do not go into the, or the shoes go into the dorm and the kitchen area and all that stuff. The boots stay on the apparatus floor. And I know that other agencies are going, you know, 
they're taking steps like that and they're going even a little bit further where they're uh, they're allowing them to uh, dress away from their normal duty uniform if they have to and and put on uh, like their brush pants and stuff like that only when they're going on a call and then they can just uh, disrobe and, and change into a different style of uniform for when they're in the station. All right, guys, it is 10 o'clock. Um, I wanna say thank you to all of you guys for taking the time to get together. Um, and I hope that this helped out a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if I anybody hope. needs any questions or referrals, by the way, for like mental health, um, you can message me on um, Facebook, um, uh, Twitter, or Instagram, whatever you have, or if you need uh, my number, Ashley has it. Um, but if you need any sort of mental health, anything, even if it's just to vent, please um, contact me and uh, I can find a clinician in your area that's culturally competent, because that's the key here is people that get our lifestyle. Um, some people that don't get our extra stresses and our extra level of concern will not understand what we're going through and our fears. So please reach out if you need anything. And I know Ashley has a lot of contacts as well as I do um, in all areas, even not out of California, I have contacts. Don't forget to wash your hands. <laughs> yes. And have a good attitude, make the best of it and reach out to each other. We're in this together as fire families. We're always in it together, guys. No matter if it's the COVID-19 or if it's something else, that's the unique and beautiful thing about this life is we always have each other. Thank you for allowing me to yeah, if, continue to for, be part of your lives. And, and for those of you that are still on, I'm, I'm gonna give a shout out to all you wives. You guys are great. Thank you for the support. All right. Thanks, Good job, Ash. ladies. Keep it up. Okay. Bye. We're going to get through Bye. this. I promise. I love you. Thanks, Ash. Yes. Bye, guys. Mwah, mwah, mwah.